Our first question comes from Diana Gilbert. Vlad, why do Navalny, Karamurza and other intelligent Russian men and women publicly speak out in Russia knowing they'll go to prison? Why don't they leave Russia and do it from outside? What I mean is, would they do it again? Navalny, yes. Karamurza, yes. Ilya Yashin, yes. And we can go down the line because there are others. But here is something really important. It is true that Alexei Navalny has gained gravitas while being in prison. He is Putin's enemy number one. He is kept alive only because him alive is for now more convenient for Putin than him dead. Um, but he's being routinely tortured and he's in appalling conditions. But nevertheless, his political and moral standing is growing so that if he ever is free and alive, he could make a big contribution. He will have a considerable um, political weight to draw on. But I actually now think that he could have done more from outside of Russia than I previously thought. And that's because Russian opposition abroad has largely failed to unify and to get over themselves and to get over quarreling among themselves about minutiae. Navalny wouldn't have tolerated that. Navalny wouldn't have tolerated even some of the things his own team has done while he's been in prison. And so I think that um, it's more palpable now that uh, a, a role for somebody like him, even if you're critical of his leadership style, uh, is absent among the overseas Russian opposition. And so that's something that I've, I've really evolved on um, over time. Our second question comes from Alexander Kurilov. It's in Russian. So let me begin reading it in Russian and I'll be quick to just translate that way. Is there something that Russians living in Europe could do чтобы приблизить конец этой ужасной войны или чтобы ослабить ее негативные последствия. Um, is there something Russians living in Europe could do to bring about the end of the war and um, help out with it, the disastrous consequences of the war, alleviate the consequences? Um, I am one of those Russians and I am torn between two wishes. Integration in my new environment in Germany um, and constant absorption in content about Russian, Russia um, and contribution to um, the Ukrainian cause as well as contribution to anybody sort of oppositional or anybody who is uh, battling uh, to help folks avoid conscription and so on. Um, this is connected to our previous question. So I would start with don'ts. I would start with the idea that you should support yourself and anybody else around you who is a Russian who is thinking about going back, even if you're not thinking of going back, there are people around you who might be thinking about going back. Um, and what's important is that these people do not become absorbed in minor factionalist quarrels within the Russian opposition abroad. So disregard these quarrels. That's very, very important. And just keep looking at the big picture. So that means not blanking people who are quarreling, but continuing to engage with their content and even support them, even though they're engaged in trashy conflict. So when Mark Fagan says that Alexei Venediktov should be prosecuted for being excessively um, in a position of compromise, if not collusion with the Putin regime over the last few years, is that a repulsive thing to say? It is. What should you do? Continue watching Fagan. Continue supporting Fagan. Continue watching Venediktov. Continue supporting Venediktov. So being disciplined about not getting involved in the trash show that Russian opposition as a 
collective entity is generating at the moment, unfortunately, is really, really important. And here the attitude is not, I'm going to ignore the trash. The attitude is, yes, you have done a number in your nappies, but I will not turn away. I will continue to dance with you. That's the correct response, I think, to these different factions. Um, and you can see this working out just with um, Dost, the story that happened with the um, Russian oppositional channel that's trying to make itself you know, a home in Latvia. Ignore those Russians who are excessively um, devoid of empathy about the Latvian context and who are calling, um, you know, who are calling Latvians just Putin in reverse. Don't ignore them, ignore their, their point that they're making, continue to engage with them. So just look past that, but also look past petty people who want to destroy Dost in part because they're competitive with it. So empathy with Latvia, empathy with the Baltics, um, a critical consciousness that Dost could have done things better, could have communicated better. But then a basic understanding that Europe's position, Europe's and Europe's values and Europe's security interests is to stand with Dost. Why do you want to stand with Dost? You want to stand with Dost because if you look at professional journalism that addresses Russians who are oppositional, Dost is number one. Yeah? So look at the big picture. A key thought is that we're going to be talking about a lot of Russians who are overseas now who are going to go back. So they have to go back in a state whereby they haven't been toxically absorbed into some kind of silo and they're unwilling to talk to others. They have to go back engaged and they have to go back, I think, being part of a conversation that is very constructive about Russia's future vision. And so this again, a vision for Russia's future. So this again, takes us to a very important point, that when you, as a Russian in Germany, support Ukraine to win the war, which is in Russia's national interest, um, and you support discourse among the Russian opposition, discourse about how to bring about a more democratic polity in Russia, you're doing two separate things, not one. Okay, so this is very important. Don't allow your Russian anti-Putinist position to get absorbed into servicing the discourse needs of, if not Ukraine, then of um, certain segments of the Ukrainian internet. Yeah, they are separate things. You can be positive and supportive of both, but don't allow them to uh, become completely conjoined. This is a risk for some Russian opposition right now, that um, they are trying to basically ally themselves simply with Ukrainian discourse and they're forgetting about the Russian population that needs to be woken up from its slumbers. So this is really important. You know, don't turn away from any of the major figures in the Russian opposition, but um, do not get sucked into their game of who is more anti-Putin and who is more anti-imperialist and who is, you know, uh, purer than pure. Um, it's a very good thing to be pure, but it's also a good thing to be politically constructive and to cooperate and to actually engage in effective as opposed to expressive politics. So this is probably 2% of what you needed to hear, but this is a little bit of an answer. The next question comes from C. Auguste Dupin, and it's, Hey Vlad, what's your view of Camille Galeev's take that the Russian Federation will collapse and separate out into different territories? See, I don't know that that's Camille's take. I know he has talked about this, and I know he has emphasized that this possibility is underestimated. It'll be great if you could talk about this issue in a new video. You see, you might be right, it might take a new video. Let me put it this way just in a sort of cursory way. Um, 
the prospect of Russia disintegrating are um, just in a sheer probabilistic sense treated with less enthusiasm in the um, academy and among experts, among Russianists, among East European political experts than they are on Twitter. And so that's helpful. In other words, people feel, well, whatever might be preferable here, the odds of Russia's collapse are massively uh, exaggerated. Moreover, this story about Russia's collapse is something that much Russian opposition figures who in some cases are losing a little bit friction with reality and a little bit friction with Russia, as it is, not as they would wish it to be, they're overpeddling that story partly for what we were just reasons we were discussing before, these reasons of purity and trying to be anti-Putin and anti-the Russian state. But, um, and, and out of a desire to comply with the natural sort of wish of countries on Russia's border, uh, to see in their imagination, not Russia next to their border, but just a beautiful ocean, peaceful, beautiful ocean, well, for a fantastic boat ride and so on, nothing there to threaten us. So um, these prospects get exaggerated. All kinds of issues about distribution of wealth in Russia, about demography, begin to look a lot more complex yeah, when you look into them seriously. So the more you find out about this issue, the more skeptical you're going to become about the chances of Russia disintegrating. But as I say, you know, I'm saying this to you as somebody who is indeed open to the possibility that Russia's borders are going to begin to, to swim. But the question is how and to what extent. And a sort of major fragmentation of Russia is both, I think, less likely and also um, less predictable in the sense that you're going to get on balance positive consequences. I mean, you could get um, a, a radical, um, you know, ethnically driven Russian state that comes out of the fragmentation of Russia, that it possesses nuclear weapons and is even more threatening than what we've got now. So you've got to think about that properly. Uh, but in terms of, you know, statistics, if you, the, the probabilities of that happening, even though this is a bit of an uncertainty, I would say, yeah, it, you, you can radically overestimate the chances that this is going to happen if you spend too much time on Twitter. Um, Unlike a lot of academic experts who mock Kamil Galev, I don't mock him for two reasons. I think his threads are provocative. I think that they stimulate thought. And I also think that he is a thinker and an expert of the younger generation. He needs to be given the possibility to develop and not shut down. Next question is from Kay Ma, and she says, Hi Vlad, what's your opinion? How long can this war last? Greetings from Kiev. I think, in a way, there are three layers to how we think about this, and I should not say anything military. That's not my area. Um, and the third layer we can put aside, and that's Ukraine winning the peace after it's won the war. Then we've got two layers left. The first is, how do you kick the Russians out of Ukraine so that the Russian army leaves or largely leaves all Ukrainian territory that has been taken either since Feb 2022 or since before that? And how do you get bombs to stop falling on people's heads in Ukraine? Now, I think that there is then a second sense of winning the war for Ukraine, and that is for the Putinist project to no longer pose a threat because we mustn't forget that Ukraine is a territory on which a certain kind of 
geopolitical challenge to the world that Putin is elaborating is being expressed. That's to say, if we wave the magic wand tomorrow and Putin was back to February 23rd, 2022 borders, or even kicked out further than that, he'd still say, let's take Kiev when we can. Can't do it now, let's do it in five years. Can't do it in five, let's do it in ten. Can't do it at all during my um, leadership. Let's get my successor to do it. So there's a certain kind of tension on the ex-Soviet space whereby forces of a kind of democratic modern republic sort are in conflict with imperial tyranny. That conflict needs to be resolved for Ukraine to be completely safe. So in that wider sense of winning the war, it's a much more complex story. Of course, there are things that will help, such as Ukraine kicking the Russians out much of the way or all the way, and having a military so strong that it couldn't be defeated by conventional Russian forces. That helps. But in the end, you're talking about a kind of political transformation that involves Russia and Belarus happening on that territory, that ex-Soviet territory. And that is part of Ukraine getting the kind of peace and stability that can make you relax. So that's, I think, the beginning of this conversation about which, of course, there's so much more to say. But I do believe in the need to be optimistic enough to think that um, that first goal of kicking the Russians back is something that there's a prospect of being achieved in a year or in months to come. A prospect, no guarantees. And I also think that it's very important for Ukraine now to start thinking about a post-war future because Ukraine itself having a healthy democracy is a huge part of that tension I've described on the ex-Soviet space being resolved in a way that works for Ukraine's security. That's a little bit of the beginning of this conversation. Basti asks, assuming complete defeat of Russian forces in the next few months, and considering the propaganda influence in Russia until now, how traumatic would this be um, uh, for the Russian population? How would it play out on an individual level? And how should we prepare for this? I'm thinking of historical examples like Germany post-war or some kinds of deformations in Western democracies happening now with conspiracy theories and loss of trust. Um, Depends on how Russia loses. Um, I think that whether Russia loses Crimea is huge to this conversation, because I think that Crimea being lost is an existential challenge to Russia's historical self-image. Um, um, and nothing else really would be. Being pushed back to where we were in February wouldn't, wouldn't do that. So, uh, we're simply back to this conversation of what wakes up that middle blob, that depoliticized 50, 60, 65% of the Russian population. And simply being pushed back to where we were in February um, may not do that, but it would generate um, a great deal of kerfuffle and tension and uh, even more um, active post-Putin uh, planning uh, in the elites than is happening now. Um, that's my brief shot. Anthony asks, um, do you know of tangible ways we can act toward increasing the chances of Putin and the Russian powers committing war crimes in this war, earnestly being charged and indicted? Yes, you do whatever would maximally promote change in Russia, and you do so effectively. And if you're in the West, you have got 
less clarity than folks on Russia's borders have about what a threat Putin really is. But you might have more clarity about how to effectively approach that threat because you've got that distance. Um, and so to go back to what we were saying earlier, you could support uh, TV Rain, um, not by telling off Latvia, but by saying that the Western position is that that kind of project should be um, supported. But there's nothing really you can do to bring that about, except do whatever you can do to bring about change in Russia's borders. And that probably means, uh, if you like, working in a constructive way with those Russian score and the West now who are planning to go to Russia when things begin to change. Um, I just want to say something about the conversation we're having, something about you, all of you, this beautiful community, and something about me. Um, these videos are for you. And so please feel that that's what's going on here, really. In other words, don't feel the pressure to watch the whole thing. Feel free to jump around. And I, I'm really, really fine because these videos are for the community. They're not to grow the channel in any way. Um, we try to do a bit of that on the main channel when I'm well enough to make videos there. So if you just want to come in and you want to jump straight to your time slice and the answer to you, know just how how happy and delighted I am that we've had this sort of communication. There's never any pressure to sit through all of this um, Q&A. Now about me, I want you to focus as we get go on with more questions, very much on my intent um, and on the inflection of my voice as I answer rather than on what I say, um, because I'm not on top form today. We're talking from bed and I gathered these questions. It took me about two hours and that was 70% of my physical energy for the day. And it's funny because certain tasks with my condition are surprisingly hard relative to others. So actually talking to you now is easier for me physically than um, gathering the questions because that required multitasking. And I really struggle with having a, a, a phone and then another screen and, and then a, another window and then moving between three places to organize all these questions in the same spot and so on. I participated um, in a study. It was the first study just for men with myalgic encephalomyelitis and was in the hot, in a, um, VA hospital in Miami. Um, few years ago and as part of that I was pushed to the limit physically but also with cognitive testing and the cognitive testing caused even more physical symptoms in me than the, the physical stuff so it's interesting um, so I'm doing my best but we're focusing on intent here because um, I may not be articulating myself concisely GDP progress Hi, asks, what are the points that support the proposition that Putin would have attacked other countries? Um, I don't like lining up facts and saying that's evidence. Obviously, we would start with Putin's civilizational turn, which he took around 2012, 20, 2014, where he began emphasizing Russia's um, need to challenge the world order and to challenge the West. Then we're going to look at the ultimatum um, before the war that Russia gave the West. That's going to be absolutely central. Um, so th that sort of list could be continued. But here is something really important that's s said with a little bit of distance from this conversation. I'm going to do a video just on this on the Philosophy Channel. There are three kinds of um, claim we tend to make when we have conversations about the social world. We can make a factual claim. We can make an interpretive claim 
or we can make a normative claim. So a normative claim is Mr. Putin should be defeated. You know, a factual claim is Mr. Putin is bombing civilian infrastructure. Um, somebody could argue that's a bit of an interpretive claim because that, that distinction could be a little bit fluid between military and civilian targets. But the degree of interpretation there will be minimal. And then there are interpretive claims like, what are the intentions of the Kremlin today? You know, um, how do we understand Putin's civilizational mission? How do we understand his broad war aims? So that's not a normative question. That's not about what we would or would not like to see happen. Um, but it's not a factual question either, because it's not a fact. Um, uh, it's not a matter of fact what's inside Putin's head. This is going to be an interpretive narrative. It doesn't mean it can't be true or false, but it means it requires interpretation. And so it's important that this is an interpretive question. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time emphasizing what kind of a category that is, you know, making interpretive claims, because we really, really, as a culture, struggle. We're a scientific culture, and we struggle with this. We tend to jump from the factual to the, to the normative, from the normative to the factual. Um, so basically, the answer is going to lie in a series of interpretations of what the Kremlin has been up to in recent years. That sounds so banal, but it's so incredibly important. Next question comes from Sneaker, and Sneaker says, The astonishing rise of conspiracy theories and claiming everything is fake shows precisely how our world can only function on an assumption of good faith. Bad faith thinking is toxic and takes us nowhere good. Corruption, war, and collapse. Any thoughts? Yeah. No. No. Um, except yes. Yes, in the most sort of extreme sense of your formulation, then I'd agree. If we take good faith in, in, in a kind of extreme sense, that um, what we're trying to do is avoid the most repulsive, ghastly, transparent bad faith, the sort of thing that the Russian propaganda machine is up to, just flagrant, repulsive lying or post-truthing, which is worse than lying. Okay, there I can say, let's do good faith, if you call good faith the opposite of that. But that's not what I think we should call good faith. Um, I think good faith should be a special kind of purity from not just conscious bad intent or conscious attempts at deception, um, but from psychopathology that corrupts thought. You see? There's a YouTube uh, channel um, uh, that makes a big emphasis on good faith conversations. You know? And I don't buy good faith conversations. I believe in mixed faith conversations. I think that I'm going to be very blunt about this. Um, I wouldn't be speaking to many people if I expected the level of integrity that I have on their part, you know? So I am happy to speak to people who have some integrity, but not all the way, maybe. Um, if I didn't speak to people like that, I wouldn't be a good citizen. I wouldn't be sharing the table of politics with everybody who is there, who is realistically representing large parts of the polity. So we might want to say no to people who have the most horrific bad faith, but mixed faith is of the very essence of politics. If you want to do good faith, you could, with, you know, moralistic self-congratulatoriness, sit at home. That's my sort of crude answer. Stefan says, hi, Vlad. How do we process integrate Jeffrey Sachs's assertions, Jeffrey Sachs's assertions um, and or knowledge that the US constantly meddles everywhere and can be accused of provoking and escalating um, as currently popularized by Russell Brand. It was an interesting move. I would have advised him against it on balance. Um, I would have advised Jeffrey Sachs against going on Russell's show 
because his view was locked to a certain kind of board. So here goes um, Jeffrey Sachs on Russell's show and boom, two other positions or three other positions get locked in for Jeffrey, positions that he doesn't want to have. He's there to talk about American imperialism and probably positions on trust in public institutions, positions on pandemic management, positions on um, the jabs, are all positions implicitly ascribed to Jeffrey just because he appears on that show. Um, so it's difficult to negotiate this environment. And again, I don't recommend just going on good faith platforms. That's, that's not constructive. Um, it's going to leave you in a tiny bubble. Um, so, but apart from Russell, um, who is likable because he behaves badly transparently um, and is damaging transparently. Um, so likable, a likable sort of narcissism there. But I think Jeffrey Sachs should be taken seriously and he should be debated with seriously. I think that Jeffrey is right on a kind of a long line he is trying to draw that holds together quite a few issues fairly well, but it doesn't hold this wall very well. That's what I would say. It really doesn't hold this wall well at all. And I think that's troubled a lot of people who are really anti-hawkish on US foreign policy, but then they've run into an issue where you should be hawkish, this one. So that's the beginning of that conversation. Russ asks, in the recent video on Putin as a rational actor with regards to potential use of nuclear weapons, you quoted Putin as saying that you don't want a world if Russia isn't in it. And there was also a question with regard to Putin using the royal we. To me, it seems that this logically is the conclusion from Putin's view, he is Russia. Yes, that's what I say. And others too say that. And so a world without Putin might, might as well not exist. He half thinks that, yeah. Should we all be hoping that the rumors of Putin's various terminal illnesses are in error? Um, I don't think that this is as revolutionary either way as people make it out to be. I don't think that Putin being healthy or Putin being terminally, terminally ill radically changes, radically changes the safety of the world. Um, that's my um, assessment. Um, but we do need to be consistently worried that Putin says that unless Russia manages to express itself in a certain way in the world, there's less value in that world existing. And Russia expressing itself a certain way is tied to the will of a single individual, and that's Putin. And so we've got to be careful. And again, just in the past week, Putin has talked about how he is open to a first strike when it comes to nuclear weapons. Rory asks, um, yes, it's important to... So Rory asked the question and I responded by saying, look, if you've got an extreme conspiracy theorist you're engaging with, the issue you're debating isn't really the issue. You know, if you're debating whether Everest is higher than one kilometer, um, you're not really having a conversation about the height of mountains. You're having a conversation about the difference between illusion and reality. And Rory says, yes, but what about the importance of bystanders to this conversation? Should one not state the truth with evidence, um, not to persuade those who are full of this passionate conspiratorial intensity, but those who are perhaps bystanders and who don't have settled conviction and so on. Look, the most important thing about online conversations, I'm afraid, is that you've got to be selfish and you've got to prioritize your own mental health. I'm sorry, but that is number one, number two, number three. Otherwise, you won't be able to help anybody. And I think a lot of people get into a dynamic where their online diet is really not so healthy. And I would say, be brutal about that. And if that means turning me off, turn me off, you know? Um, 
not because I think I'm putting unhealthy things into you, but I also think it's just important to not consume too much of a good thing too, you know? Um, by the way, I got a, a message today from YouTube saying that there's three and a half million views on the chat channel, which is just me turning the smartphone on and, on and speaking to you. Um, three and a half million views in the last 10 months, which is less than on the main channel, but it's, it's fantastic for a second conversational channel. But there can be too much of a good thing. So I would say, first of all, focus on your own needs, Rory. Secondly, um, be always efficacious about the matter of persuasion. And don't assume that the truth in of itself has social power. Truth does not have social power. If we debate each other, and you're right and I'm wrong, it doesn't make it more likely that you'd persuade me just because you're right. You know, so be aware that it it's only a very special, very coercive environment in which truth matters. So, for example, I am often in environments where the social power of truth is really real. And these are academic philosophy seminars. And there could be 20 people in the room. And you really, really could get somebody to change their mind on an important issue on which they've staked part of their career. And we're ruthless and we go for each other. Um, but that's a very special, very coercive environment. It's a very ritualized environment. And, you know, there are many environments where truth has a real shot of succeeding just because it's the truth. So, you know, always be efficacious and don't think that just repeating um, uh, the balanced perspective, the reasonable perspective on something is on of itself going to be, in of itself going to be effective. Now, there's much more to say, but we'll leave it for now. Um, there is an anonymous question here. I've seen you on a couple of very small channels. What's your philosophy for, I'm going to be brief answering this. What's your philosophy for allocating your time given that you say you work two or three hours a day? My philosophy is indirect reciprocity. So if uh, Susanna with 17 follows invites me on, and invites me on in a non-selfish way by saying, not the nonsense that people often say, enjoy the exposure that my audience can give you. You've got 17 followers. What kind of exposure are you talking about? But if Susanna writes to me and says, I've got 17. I really, really want 117. You can pull me over. Please come. If I have the health and the possibility, I come. And I expect the reciprocity not back from Susanna, but from Jessica, who has 500,000 followers. So... I do something for Susanna, Jessica does something for me. So this is the kind of reciprocity that I believe in. So just because I give, I don't expect anything back from you. Ferrari guy, um, what's the safest way out of this that preserves a direction towards Westernism, or at least the status quo rather than sliding back into totalitarianism or democratic decline? And... Can it put a stake in the heart of this current challenge without ending up in some kind of Treaty of Versailles situation where Russia freaks out and bounces back and so on? Um, it's important to balance this issue of Russia needing to lose, but after Russia losing, Russia needing our constructive engagement. You know? And if there's a post-Putin future that comes in the medium term, We've got to be very engaged with that post-Putin Russia, very constructively engaged. Um, otherwise, we'd get the same thing um, that's going to grow out of the same cultural myths. These cultural myths and images will not evaporate just because they are partly broken by a catastrophic defeat against Ukraine. In the West, we've got to talk about um, trust in an inclusive way. We've got to talk about trust in a way that includes all citizens, even citizens with whom conversing we find uncomfortable. At the moment, our circle for what we want to welcome to the table of politics is too narrow. It needs to broaden. And that's tough 
but that's some of what we're going to have to do so much more i'm going to say about this in 2023 hopefully on the channels if not before um coho warren warren asks i support ukraine how much of ukraine news is our propaganda um well obviously you're going to be blinded if you're the victim completely innocent victim of a brutal and genocidal war you're going to have the clearest perspective on every issue under the sun sure the, the key thing for Ukraine that I, I think is really important is that Ukraine faces two challenges that just the, the, the immersion in this hell that Putin is imposing on Ukraine can make it difficult to see. Ukraine needs to be regionally constructive. So that means realizing that, uh-oh, it's actually in our national interest to engage with the opposition, for example, in Belarus because we're trying to make forces succeed that go beyond just sovereign borders of Ukraine. We're trying to make certain kinds of democratic forces succeed. It's one thing. Second thing, there's a tension between Ukraine getting solidarity today and Ukraine having all the pluralistic health it needs to function as a democracy post-war. There is such a thing as getting solidarity too quickly and too much on the cheap in the way that then compromises these pluralistic aims later. So these are some of the tensions Ukraine is dealing with. Um, I suppose in a more banal, well, can, banal sort of sense, can you trust everything you see on Ukrainian YouTube and Ukrainian Twitter? No, of course you shouldn't. Um, next question is, hi Vlad, from PB, but from many others. Could you talk more specifically uh, about what you mean by mysticism? Well, no, actually, because it's an enormously contested concept. I said something about facts, interpretations, and then normative views. A mystical position would say that you have access to reality, social reality, or metaphysical reality, that goes beyond these three ways of engaging with the world. So what have you got there, Mr. Putin? Is it a, is it a factual observation? No. Is it an observation that is interpretive? No. Is it a normative claim? No. It's me having some kind of special access to Russia's civilizational mission that I can't fully uh, uh, um, uh, articulate. I can't articulate it in terms of ordinary sort of ways that we all agree about that we have of perceiving the world. It almost feels like it it comes from some kind of other way of perceiving, some kind of further way of perceiving the world. And if you can perceive the world like that, you do get access to a kind of reality you can't see otherwise, you know? And I want to leave it that vague because you're going to get straight into 17 controversial philosophical debates. But I think... you. The, the, this is the direction and maybe we'll shift this to the philosophy channel to say more if you allow me to do this. Marcin says, uh, if you're familiar with the captive mind, um, uh, in it what we've got is uh, Milosh describing seven forms of um, Catman applied to the People's Republics in the 20th century. Look, I'm not going to use the reference to the book because it might bypass most people. So what we're talking about is modes of behavior and modes of adaptation among the Russian population and among the Russian elites to, um, if you like, the Putinist way, to Putinist mythology, Putinist ideology, Putinist way of organizing, Putinism's way of organizing the state. 
the key answer on this to you is that what we are doing here is talking about adjustment to um, a Soviet way you know, of the Soviet social formation. And that means that you've got an ideology or a mock ideology and then various kinds of ways in which people accommodate it, you know, um, various ways in which they adjust to it by segregating their private life away from it, various ways they adjust to it by believing it and not believing it, various ways they've organized, they organize for themselves of escaping ideology, various ways they've organized them for themselves of you know, compromising with the ideology by saying, well, I'm going to advance myself, my career in this and that way, so I'm going to buy this, this and that kind of stuff that I don't feel comfortable about, but anyway. So what's different is that you're not adapting to an ideology or a mock ideology. You're adapting to a kind of a post-truth environment. You know? So what I would say um, is that the Soviet approach of saying something that pays about the ideology of the day is now replaced by saying something like nobody really knows anything about anything. Yeah? One very common feature of this is that people don't just not have a settled view about not just particular issues, but what their relationship with politics should be, but that they don't even want to look at politics too long. They know that if they look at politics for too prolonged a period, that various kinds of uh, demons will begin appearing from under the surface. And so if they're looking at politics, they say, well, I'm going to look at politics only very briefly and then move on. But the key thing you're talking about here is this extraordinary way in which under Putinism, the majority of the Russian public has segregated itself from politics and tried to um, uh, exist in this depoliticized reality with the hope that that will be stable and sustainable and it's proved the catastrophe. Um, maybe I can write directly to you a bit more on this so we can talk about this in more detail, but this is a snippet of an answer. Um, second part of your question is, um, what's some good evidence that democracy is in decline? Well, this is back in the West. This is back to the interpretive issue. Um, so starting with facts like that, all the surveys says that say that trust in public institutions is you know, going down. Um, that surveys say that people are questioning democracy like, like, like they didn't used to. That we've got more and more politicians who want to break the game, break the democratic game, break the sustenance of counter majoritarian institutions. All of that is there. But it's an interpretive story, really, why since the early 70s, in my opinion, we have got to where we've got. But I do promise you very much that we're going to start addressing this soon on, on the main channels, if only you're patient enough. Um, August Aronson asks, where do I, a non-Russian, begin the conversation with a fairly close friend, a Russian expat, and the childhood Soviet citizen who insists that the truth about Russia under Putin and about the Ukraine war is more complicated than Western observers say. It seems that for her voicing criticisms of Putin's war without qualifying it by saying Zelensky is not an angel, nature is also bad, and that this feeds into she feels Russophobic prejudices and strengthens a harmful narrative. We West good, you Russia bad. I do feel pretty confident about my anti-Putin and anti-war views, um, but I fear that maybe I'm missing something important. I don't want to dismiss her on false grounds. Here's what I'd say very briefly. Um, look, I'd say that something is up if somebody is giving me equivocation about the war. And I'm, I wouldn't be Russophobic doing that. I'd just be right. <laughs> um, so 
what is Russophobia? And I think it's worth asking the question if, if you know, your friend really is a victim of Russophobia, maybe she is. Um, I know that in the UK we've had episodic Russophobia, but basically it's quite absent. I mean, I am not Russian enough to experience Russophobia, but in, uh, even though I have very few Russians who are close to me in my life, I'm aware of Russians who have kids in school and so on, oppositional Russians. They don't have problems at all. Um, so we've got to be clear what we call Russophobia, but okay, if there is Russophobia, then here is where you should concede ground, here's where you shouldn't concede ground. You shouldn't concede ground on Putin. Putin is um, a complete and utter catastrophe. Nothing worse for Russia could be happening now than what Putin is doing. Putin is asphyxiating the future of the next generation of Russians. You know, that's on top of the genocidal war he's prosecuting in Ukraine. So Putin bad, period. Sorry. War bad, period. Sorry. No negotiated. 100% clean on that. But did the West engage constructively with Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union? No. Has the West had a good track record on um, predicting the motivations of Russia and what triggers Russia over the last 30 years? Not at all. No. Has Russia handled NATO expansion well, whether you want more of it or less of it? You might be someone who wants all of it in one go, Russia, ex uh, uh, Russia experiencing the expansion of NATO right up to its borders after the collapse of the Soviet Union, for example. Or you might be somebody who doesn't want NATO expansion to have happened. NATO expansion was not handled well. Yeah? So you got to... Then, on top of talking about this in, you know, not correct engagement with Russia, not sufficient engagement, poor handling of various kinds of things. You've also then got to raise issues around how we fail to stand up to Putin firmly enough and early enough. Yeah. So around all of that, you should concede, but don't concede the round war. War bad. Putin, Putin, bad. Bogdan asks, in the context of education in Russia, I see a ominous parallel between post-war Russia and the Weimar Republic, irrespective of how the war ends, um, how will Ukraine be safe if the totalitarian regime embeds through education a vengeful spirit in the mind of ordinary citizens? What we, when we end up with 140 million Russians who are, you know, uh, aggressively motivated and they have nuclear warheads? Um, at the moment, I am skeptical, putting aside Russia's economic depletion, I'm skeptical about the thoroughgoing fascization of Russia, if you like, the thoroughgoing conversion of Russia into a totalitarian state where passive Russians become pro-Putin citizens, if you like. It's possible, but at the moment, it's unlikely. Um, and everything we can do from the outside to work with the Russian population to not end up in that position, we should do. But I don't think we're yet in a position where we need to freak out about Russia landing in that place. Robert asks, I compose the following comment on the channel, can you assess it? Putin's regime is striving for a nationalist movement I'm not sure it's a nationalist movement that unites a Eurasian state. I don't think there's a coherent idea of a Eurasian state, which celebrates the diversity of cultures. I don't need as much celebration of diversity of cultures with Putin within an historical Russian socio-political network. I don't think it's an historical socio-political network. I think it's a set of quasi mystical and mythological ideas. So, False, 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 false. But Putin, how much of this would Putin accept? Um, I think Putin would describe himself not in nationalistic, but in, in imperialist terms. Um, 
I don't think Putin is himself that big on Eurasian ideas. He just uses them for convenience. Um, and Putin doesn't really quite think that there's a clear Russian socio-political framework, network that needs to be created and invented, and he is the author of that. Can you articulate the acronym Z? Presumably you just mean the letter Z. Um, well, all I mean when I talk about it, I try to capture it a bit sociologically, this is something about Z that goes with the idea of joy in being bad, the sense of liberation into evil. Mike asks, what do you make of the rise of stupid political art in the 20th century? What does this tell us? Is it always stupid? Is it always actually, or is it intelligent reflection on how the rise of lo-fi citizens and corresponding culture? Um, look, let me have a, have a go that might not touch on the core of what you're interested in, and then I could have a second go another time. Um, political art that has a political function is most of the time not art at all. It's agitprop, it's pop, it's entertainment, it's political activism. It's not art. Is there great political art? Yes. But there's always this tension between how much of it is politics and how much of it is art. And interestingly, the greatest piece of political art of the 20th century, Picasso's Guernica, I do think it is a masterpiece, but it may be a little lower in the ranking of Picasso's greatest masterpieces. It might not be on the level of Demoiselle d'Avignon or Le Dance. And actually, you know, Picasso privately thought that the Guernica was slightly overrated by people who thought it was at the very, very pinnacle of his output. That there are some aspects to the Guernica that are about, and I have slightly unsettled views on this, I need to spend time in front of the painting, but um, there's the possibility that there's a bit of a poster aspect to the painting. That's what Picasso personally thought about it. Um, that's a snippet. Dirt Monster, Vlad, this may be interesting. I've heard you mention Russians aren't citizens. My wife is Russian. We've lived in Aussie land for 14 years, missing Aussie land very much. Normally I spend Christmases there, not this year. Um, she's fully embraced our liberal Australian lifestyle. Her 81-year-old mother lives with us. She was an English teacher at a sports academy in the USSR in Russia. Uh, recently, my wife tried to translate for her mom, the English word community, and we struggled. Isn't this interesting that that word seems to be absent? I think this relates to some of the problems you've been describing in Russia. It was a light bulb moment for my wife. Um, so, um, and some more beautiful words. Thank you so, so much. Um, community. No? Surely. Um, Sauobshistwa. Yeah, I mean, that's a weak word in Russian, if you wanted to translate it that way. I mean, look, I don't know what exactly it means to claim that a word is untranslatable. I mean, rain up to a point means something different in Russian than it does in English, you know? Um, and you know, as soon as you use the word rain in Russian, it has quite different associations, much more animate associations than in English. Well, what I would say is that words like saobshistva inspire two things in, in, in Russian culture often. One is skepticism, the, the, in the sense of relegation of their importance. And two is a kind of cynicism that says, you can engage in these collective enterprises, but you're a bit of a naive fool if you do, because they never really work. Focus on building your own life, your own kind of substance, uh, sustenance, vrzhavanie, 
coexistence, not coexistence, existence, sustenance. My, my, my brain is floating, but we can try to move forward. Um, in our suites asks a question that is so important and I worry that I might not be able to answer it in this state, but I'm going to give it a, give it a while. Um, please touch on Belarus. Um, uh, from where I am. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on the current situation because I literally do not know what to think and I feel I'm going insane knowing that any day, any time you can be taken to prison, forced to say anything on camera and beaten up and, you know, just being depressed because of all of the opposition leaders' movements that, that you know, they're either out of touch or misled about what's going on and are bickering, okay. Um, feeling extremely bad for wanting to leave the country and forgetting about everything while leaving people who also protested in 2020 and 2022 by themselves to rot in prison. But at the same time, there's no way for me to help them and I'm scared to even write them a letter because you can get arrested for that and feeling lost. Yeah. Um, I can't help except with a little bit of clarification of the broad picture. Um, look, there is a civil war happening on the ex-Soviet space and Belarus is part of this civil war. And the civil war is between the forces of imperial tyranny and the forces that roughly align with something like the vision of a modern democratic republic. If you look at Ukraine, Belarus and Russia, they're all in very different places in relation to this civil war on that ex-Soviet space. Ukraine has said, uh-oh, we've clarified ourselves on this. We're standing for a modern democratic republic. We're trying to kick out these brutal Russians. Russia is deeply internally conflicted. That civil war is almost in a kind of 50-50 dimension in Russia. You've got the blob in the middle and you've got 10 to 20 percent on either side. The reactionary 10 to 20 percent and the pro-democratic 10 to 20 percent. Belarus is not as clear on this as Ukraine, but is much, much closer to Ukraine than to Russia, obviously. So you cannot straightforwardly say that Russia is being held hostage by the Putin regime. It's not. 70% of the population is sort of in some kind of complicit dance with the regime. But you can get much closer to truthfully saying this about Belarus, that they are much more than Russia is, that Belarus is much more than Russia is, um, a hostage of a recalcitrant reactionary tyrant. So Belarusian society is a much, much more healthy place than Russian society. There is no doubt about this. And Belarus is in a much more advanced place in this civil war. And short of Russian takeover, things are actually looking fairly promising in the short to medium term for Belarus. Um, the way I would view the protest of 2020 is not, is, is not as a failure, but as an extraordinary near success. It's remarkable that the protests happened on the scale they happened in that kind of regime. And so I'm, I'm here dismissive of criticism, some of them coming from Ukraine toward Belarusians who say, uh, 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 uh. you know, you didn't go far enough. You're not really as courageous as us and as consistent as us. Um, this is unfair because in 2014, when Ukraine is fighting for democracy, the pro-democracy forces really had 
half of the political institutions in the country on their side already. That's not at all the case in Belarus. So I think there is this hostage situation. I think Belarusian civil society, which is still very Soviet in many ways, but it's much more advanced than what we've got in Russia in terms of siding with the side we believe in in the civil war, siding with the pro-democratic forces, the forces of the modern democratic republic. I think that Belar Russia needs more active support from both the pro-democracy forces in Russia and also from Ukraine. Ukraine is in the middle of a war, Vlad. What kind of support are you talking about? Verbal support. Um, more engagement, more recognition of Belarus's government in exile from Ukraine, you know, to express better this dynamic that there really is this civil war going on in the Soviet space. So that is the framing that I would give for the horrors going on in Belarus. I don't know that it makes things easier, but I do believe that Lukashenko is in an extraordinarily vulnerable position. But the problem we've got now is that we're, we're worried about just the extent to which Russia has got its hands on Belarus, and we're going to be talking about that into the future. Um, next question comes from um, Akta Vera, and we're going to try to jump through this quickly because this is a lot. Um, let's assume that Duda and Zelensky's plan to create a close alliance between Poland and Ukraine in the shape of a German-French German-French relations will come true, probably with the participation of the Baltic states, maybe except for Belarus. And so we could have a kind of political organism like Scandinavia, only with separate countries. That would be a new version of uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. I'm not going to comment on all of this. I'm just going to comment on the question you've attached. How will such a creation affect Russia? It won't. What you've got is a question about whether the Putin regime is going to eat itself up and how it's going to do it. And once it eats itself up, what comes next and how do we engage with it? If what comes next is relatively promising, it's not going to be threatened by any kind of, you know, constructive democratic alliances not far from its borders. Um, and if it's unlovely, what comes next is going to be threatened by just about anything that happens on its border. So I'm not sure that um, this really matters that much in terms of presumably what you're talking about, which is triggering Russia in some way. Um, oh, could this drive Russia to be more democratic? Yes. Look, um, is what happens on Russia's borders going to affect what happens in Russia if Russia is in flux and we've gone into a post-Putin state? Yes, there's no doubt about that. Um, and that is precisely why Putin is so fearful of a democratic Ukraine on his borders. Um, would Belarusian society put itself in front of the authorities strongly enough um, uh, and this time would... I don't, I don't get this question, sorry. Would Belarusian society put itself in front of the authorities strongly enough to join this union that you talked about, this time as a separate political entity? Belarus's prospects are excellent short of Russia's control over it. How would Navalny react to such a uh, volition of Belarusians? Navalny's reactions shouldn't matter too much to us because we don't want Navalny in power, out of power. We want structural, systematic change in Russia. 
if you put anybody now in Putin's place, it's going to be a catastrophe. It doesn't matter if it's you or me. So what you want is fundamental reform. So talking about Navalny in abstraction, I think is unconstructive. But um, is Navalny a Democrat? Yes, he is. Um, could mass protests appear in Russia if Russians see that Belarus is drifting away from them? No. No. Um, that would require tens of millions of Putinists. You don't have that in Russia. You have a passive population. Um, more questions. Are the Russians afraid that the Chinese will buy them out and colonize them? People in Putin's administration are anxious about being a dominated partner and a very junior dependent partner, their relationship with China. Um, is there an Asian consciousness in Russia? No, there is no such thing. Is there a Western consciousness in Russia? There is a lack of a civic consciousness of any kind. So the question is, what shape will the civic consciousness take when it appears? Um, is Russia ready or will it become... Uh, 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 by choice a pacific state Russia for now is going to try to permeate into the globalized world in any way that will be allowed to it because it is being isolated um, Mario asks the economic price uh, that we might be paying in the west for supporting Ukraine is surely going to affect support if the war goes on. Greetings from Austria, what do you think? Yes, support for Ukraine over time will diminish, but we're not seeing in the West, but we're not seeing a radical diminution of this. Um, and I think that um, the brutality of how Putin is prosecuting this war is reanimating a lot of folks in the West into continuous support of Ukraine. Bob, says, um, just saw another article about Putin's health. Um, in this case, his cancer falling down the stairs, soiling himself. Um, just wondering what to make of this. Is this just disinformation? Um, uh, or is this sort of folks angling for repositioning in the regime? A bit of both. Um, I spoke to the son a few months ago at the time to the person who was writing most of their articles on Russia. Um, and obviously it's difficult if you are the son because you have a big responsibility to entertain as well as inform. But obviously I implied that I said that you should follow SVR general and these um, absurd telegram channels that are driving a lot of uh, discourse among Western experts um, that in fact has nothing to do with the reality. Um, I suspect something is wrong with Putin just from my experience of for 20 years being in the in the world of the unwell and meeting ill, Ill people and so something looks wrong in my view. But exactly what, I don't know. But looking at the chain of sources of how the sun got this information, it's not reliable at all. Um, Gavi, Gav asks, um, I like the point you made in the previous video about there being the ol oligarchs in Russia, uh, because there's nobody who can have both financial power, financial wealth, and independence. Would you say that Prigozhin could fit this definition, however? No, Prigozhin is a political actor. He's an important political actor. He will be central in endorsing whoever follows Putin or not endorsing them. And what he's looking for now is a formalization of his role. He is looking to maximally formalize his role in Russia's political system. His role is major, but it's informal. Um, it's major because basically Putin is covering Prigozhin. There's nobody else 
between Prigozhin and Putin, which is why Prigozhin is quite powerful. But he wants to formalize his role beyond just winks and nods from Putin. Um, what about in the 90s, were there oligarchs? Yes, I mean, there were many of them uh, who were real oligarchs, and they tried to control the political system and often tried to inflect it in a more democratic direction, often by using undemocratic means to get to their democratic aspirations, um, which is what happened famously with that extraordinary 1996 election, which Yeltsin won. Um, yeah, yeah, when Berezovsky was pushing around his, his role is exaggerated, but when he's pushing around his wealth, yeah, he is using mega wealth to, up to a point, influence politics. And we have reached the end. Lots of love. Congratulations on getting through to those of you who watched the whole thing. Bye bye for now.